Cafe, and those of you who are here, thank you for coming downstairs. I appreciate that. Um, I want to tell you a little bit uh, that about two years ago, I was sitting in an auditorium very similar to this one, although it was Building A, which is on the other side of the road. And uh, Neil Hunt, who was our head of product, was, uh, he made a very big mistake. He said to us, so does anybody have any questions? God, yes. <laughs> I've been waiting for this moment. And yeah, I, you. And I asked him, I said, Neil, what do we have? Um, I mean, right now we're, we're, we're in a bunch of countries and we're about to go kind of globally. And what are we going to do about getting Netflix to work streaming all over the world? I mean, how are we going to deal with the various networks that are out there? What are we going to do about prepaid plans and all these like wireless connections and broadband that doesn't look at all like the broadband we've encountered before? And Neil, uh, you know, he took, he took a little while with my question. He was a very nice, uh, nice guy in general. And he said, well, you know, this, that, the other thing. But um, what you're talking about, Guy, is that's really seven to eight years off. That's, you're thinking down the road, but we're, we're not going to be able to do that anytime soon. And I said to Neil, I said, well, that's funny because I will show it to you. I will bring this to you long before it's ready. I, I, will, I will give this to you and if you come to Hack Day. And the audience just kind of sat there like, whoa, did you just challenge Neil Hunt, the head of product? I said, yeah, you know. So here we are in Kazakhstan streaming on a 3G connection on a TV that's sitting on the back of a car in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> That's me and Kazakh man, and, I, and he doesn't speak a word of English. And he says, well, <laughs> he's like saying in, in Russian to me, he's like, this is uh, very interesting, this uh, Netflix, I would like to buy this. And I said, it's, uh, there's VPN, but um, we're, it's coming, it's coming. You know, we're working on it, and it will be there soon. So I <laughs> was a bit concerned that <laughs> he was so ready to just buy this SIM card and pop it into a TV on a car, but um, he did tell me that, uh, I mean, he had shown me like his phone and I'd seen a lot of the, the, the phones that were out there. And actually the, the internet was, was pretty good. I mean, this was a main way of people consuming the internet out there. This was not broadband households. This did not look at all like the internet that we had dealt with previously when we were building Netflix. And as it was catching on and more and more people were signing up, it was getting a lot faster, which was really nice because there was a problem that it was also getting slower in that as soon as it got faster, people would sign up and go, this is amazing, I really need to get this, but then everyone would get it. <laughs> and suddenly it would get very congested. And that was kind of a problem for us when we were looking at you know, the networks that were getting more fiber and everything was getting quick, but as we were doing it, they were, you know, more people were signing up and then all of the links were starting to fall over and you know, there, were, there were issues. And, I'm sure some of you tonight have actually dealt with that in a performance audience, but um, that I told him just like I said to Neil, I said, look, let's, I, I don't want to wait. I mean, there are real engineering challenges out there. We need to know what they are. We need to get in front of them. So it is possible, but it's also going to involve some pretty hard cuts in the app. Right, so there are, there are things which are extremely bandwidth intensive. There are things which require fast round trip time back to the servers. And those don't exist. <laughs> so there, there was a, this was all kind of predicated on it's better to have an app that actually works than an app that um, has every single feature but doesn't work. So I told him, like I told a lot of the people here, we really need to know what this looks like. And we don't need to have an average of what it looks like. I don't, I don't want to know that in the average population of Netflix users, half of them are on pretty good internet and everything works fine, and the other half, that's why I have a job. So I instead said, well, let's, let's go start picking all of this data up and let's send it back. Which immediately led to two very quick conclusions. The first was that it would be fine to just kind of average that. Except averaging is a little bit tricky in that, you know, you start seeing, you don't know what the distribution itself looks like. You know what the average is, and you have no idea if that average is there because you have two very bipolar things in, in your distribution where you have a whole bunch of like, say, caching behavior, which is taking zero milliseconds, and infinite behavior where things are timing out. And that doesn't really help us like deal with that. And 
But so what do you do with the massive amount of metrics? Do we, do we just capture everything and log everything back to our servers? Well, no, that's way too much data. So we're going to start sampling. Well, we can just pick a sample and say that this is actually what it looks like for the population, but the problem is we don't know if that's what it looks like for the larger population. We don't know how good our sample is. We don't know if the sample applies to the markets that we were looking at. We don't know how good that information is going to lead us regarding the, the population. And so I had, re had then seen a talk from uh, Jim Roskind, and he had, used, he had used this term of having a massive map reduce out of every single client in the world. So why not take all the clients, let them chew on the data a little bit, and send the aggregated result back up? So now we don't have to log absolutely everything, but we can see absolutely everything. And so from that, I said, all right, well, let's build a picture. Let's, let's see what the internet looks like. We now have this model of kind of a number of metrics which might be incredibly fast. So in the particular case I was looking at, it was network flows. So I, I, I wanted to see every single network flow that was going from a device, but that's, I can't make one network log for every network flow. I'm going to just double my traffic volume immediately. But I do have a fast metric. There's other fast metrics such as key responsiveness, you know, frame rates, you know, are we dropping frames on clients? These are, these are bad things. But I need something which works that has flat memory usage and is very quick to insert. So if I have any one of these sets of data points, I can put it into a data structure very quickly, filter out anything that's not important, send that back up to the server. So for those of you who haven't seen it, this is kind of um, a constant standard, constant bin histogram. Um, and it more, this is actually from some field data where we're seeing a lot of behavior is working exactly as we expected it to in the lab and our simulations are good. And then we've got all these outliers. And the outliers was exactly where Kazakh man was standing with me when we were over there. So we were looking at these histograms and we said, well, how do we get some usable information from that? And so spoke to some of my math colleagues and they said, ah, well, the trick to that is you have the, you have the aggregated data, you, have, you need to calculate the inverse empirical cumulative distribution function, which is a real piece of cake. You see, you just take this equation and actually you just use R. R is much better at this. So I, I don't want to figure this equation out at all. And I just pulled in the histogram tools library that Google had already built for us and everybody else who likes open source, took that data that was in the histogram and then popped out this IECDF. And then I can say from that, all right, where's the median? Where's the 95th percentile? Where's the 75th? Whatever. Suddenly I notice the problem in my old graph. I have equal information in the area of interest as I do in the area of the outliers. I don't need to know how much of an outlier they are. I need to know that they are an outlier. I mean, when the connection snaps and stops working, it's slow. It's too slow for the user, whatever it is. So I don't need as much information over there as I do over here, where I have my 50th, you know, actually in this blue line uh, next to the red line, which has the 95th percentile. And there's another nice solution to that. I can actually space out the histogram in a different way. This is an exponentially spaced histogram where I'm putting a lot more information over here on the left um, in my area of interest as opposed to the area over on the right where it's slow and I don't need to know exactly how slow. Turns out that if you watch those numbers in the top right corner uh, that it didn't actually change that much. I have almost exactly the same median and 95th percentile when I calculate both of these which led to a wonderful situation that I was now in. Now we knew that we had a lot of data and it was better than the opinions. And to give you some sense of context of when I was debating this at the time, these are actual quotes, I will protect the innocent, that I got from a number of people internally that were telling me exactly how networks worked around the world. Well, we live in a 50 millisecond world. Thank you, that's my joke. <laughs> I couldn't believe when I was actually sitting in a meeting. And, and there's nothing 50 milliseconds about this world. <laughs> maybe, maybe around here, but that's it. Well, no one really minds looking at the spinner when you're loading the app. I mean, it's not that bad. I mean, the, lap, the app loads eventually. Do you guys mind? I mind, okay, <laughs> but I'm biased. I'm a performance engineer. These guys definitely mind, but, and you know, well, why should I spend any time with that instead of implementing this new cool feature that's coming along? Or, you know, well, there's no way our client is making that many requests. <laughs> it doesn't need to do all that network 
junk? You know? And I said, oh, that's interesting because we measured it. But it doesn't matter because any architecture you're going to pick, it's hard. And one of the things we needed to take away from this, we needed to make it simple and cheap to experiment out in the field. And we had to get a very quick read on what we were getting. So that's why we built Daedalus. So this is actually our uh, viewer. Um, in addition to the client libraries that actually you know, are collecting the raw data and kind of chomping on it out at the edge. And this views the aggregation of all of those histograms. So as all of the clients are collecting this data, the, in this particular case, I'm actually going to be measuring DNS. And I was kind of curious about how, what DNS looked like around the world. And you know, it actually looked pretty good. Up here towards the top, this is you know, very fast DNS requests. Down here at the bottom is stuff that's really slow. And I see a nice band here at the bottom which is DNS timing out. <laughs> that's our client giving up. And I don't know why there's anything below that, but that's, that's a separate issue. And, and this is actually, and each of these vertical columns shows a different hour of the day. So I can look across in this multi-dimensional histogram, I can look across the day and see how this is changing over time on a particular network, on a particular ASN, on a particular device that's in that ASN, whatever I want to break it down. And I said, well, that's fine. It's going to be a piece of cake, except that's the US until I saw this. And I'm not going to tell you where this is, but it's a lot closer to Kazakh men than my first side over here. Um, and that scared the bejesus out of me. And, and that is actually what we were dealing with. So we had to be really, this immediately informed, all right, you guys got to be really serious about your DNS caching. Okay, I know you want it like really short timeout so that you can like fail over to another region. <laughs> this is going to be a problem. So, we started, we, and we've done our visual inspection. We have a general sense of what the data looks like. We know what the distribution roughly is. And now we need to start getting some hard numbers out of it. We need to say, OK, well, how is this being affected build over build? Are we getting better or worse? And what does it look like? You know, how do we compare it across ISPs? And so like I said before, the IECDF helps us with that and our nice little bit of R. And that leads us to being able to visualize it. Now, in this particular case, in the graph I'm about to show you, not this graph, um, the 50th percentile that I've calculated from all of these histograms is here along the x-axis. And the 95th percentile is along the y-axis so that I can get a sense of how far apart are these two things. So when I'm looking at my 50th and my 95th, if they're really close together, I have a very well-behaved network. It never fluctuates at all. And if the 50th gets really far away from the 95th, it's, I know that I can't count on connectivity around that particular metric. So I'm going to have to use some pretty serious caching strategies. Now, of course, in some cases, it turned out that the 95th was actually faster than the 50th percentile, which was time traveling. And that was a problem that we had on a number of TV devices that happened to have not very good clocks. And so they would show us things that were kind of unbelievable. So you always have to take a look at your data. But, um, and then what, what would sort of happen here is if, if I was along this line, it would actually just be the 95th was equal to the 50th. So at whatever latency it was, it was just slow or fast, but it was consistent. As I got into this top left quadrant, very inconsistent. This is kind of the dangerous area. So we're kind of OK in this green area, but as we kind of crawl up, things get a little more challenging. So this is actually in that same segment of networks before, that data by ASN. So this is by ISP, more or less. And the size of the bubble gives you an idea of the population size of how many TVs we have in that particular region. And you know, they're, these are all really good. I don't, I don't really have an issue. I mean, they're all kind of clustered really tight. And those are getting kind of slow. But even on the top right over there, it's still constant. So it's, it's, it's latent, but it's constant. It's, it's, all of the data is getting to the device. Now that ISP up there, that's what keeps me up at night. <laughs> this is really our challenge when we start looking. And then I, I colored these based on um, similar network characteristics using k-means. So we got, a, we got a sense of where, which populations we should be testing against. So just kind of blowing up this bottom left, I can see again, you know, a bunch of the ISPs are acting really well. And then there's kind of things that are getting more challenging. So I have an area of interest now to start looking at new programmatic, uh, fixes to try to work around some of this behavior. And that was all pretty good, except these are TVs, smart TVs. Smart TVs tend to be owned by households that are doing all right. And they tend to have broadband that works. <laughs> so then when I looked at the Android data, 
things got a lot worse. <laughs> so, I mean, the scale has completely changed here. The 95th is nowhere near the 50th on any of these networks. So this, this meant that, I mean, these ISPs, they're gonna be really challenging. So, I mean, there's, again, there's, there's a product need. I mean, we're gonna, we're gonna need to identify, we don't know what the size of the total populations are there, but they're gonna be significantly big. So we basically took all this data and we said, it's hard to look at the raw data, but it would be a lot easier if we actually just built something that would emulate it so that we could actually feel what it looks like. So this was actually um, an ASUS router that I took that I plugged in a display and I, in my first iteration, I was trying to emulate the Orange network and I thought that would be pretty cool because the Orange network is actually a pretty well behaved network. And then I ran into one of my French colleagues who told me, oh, no, 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 this is not Orange, this is Orange. <laughs> and so I, you know, fixed it. But anyway, I, I showed them and I said, oh, well, don't worry about it because now we have the ability to kind of emulate these networks and that is actually what I want to leave you with. Don't, don't guess. Just because the metric is moving really, really fast, we have options and we can actually figure this stuff out. So we'll be able to build better software if we can see that distribution. And I have all of the details of everything that I showed you, including how to do all that up there on that blog. So thank you very much.